Black Lagoon has quite unexpectedly become a mainstay here on the channel in the past months. And for good reason, there's a lot to unpack under the grit and grime the series presents. With realistically branching arguments, complex motivations, and criminal mastermind plots, it's safe to say there's always a lot under the surface. And this is in no small part due to Rock, the man who's both wiping away the grime and coating himself in it at the same time. This is something most of you saw me talk about before in respect to season 1 and 2, without Roberta's blood trail, a misstep on my part. But today, we'll be correcting that mistake, delving deep into the shadows of Rowanaper to uncover what Rock was really up to in the OVA, why he did it, and what it really meant for him and the very nature of the city itself. I'll be mentioning pre-Blood Trail material, uh, but because I covered it separately, I'll avoid restatements as much as possible. So check out the card on screen now if you want a look at how Rock became a heroic villain. But I'll end my ramble so we can get into things here. Roberta's blood trail picks up on a depressed Rock, meandering his way through the streets of the damned city to finish his work with a complete lack of vigor or sign of life. This comes back to his failures in the seasons before, Garcia, the Romanian twins, and Yukio as major points. He consecutively allowed himself to dive deeper and deeper into the darkness of the criminal world around him, hoping that his efforts could produce some good in a world devoid of humanity. Failing so constantly at this would take a toll on anyone, but it would be an understatement to say this was the only reason he was depressed to start. His ire was much deeper than just that. In my last Rock video, I think I underestimated Balalaika a bit, the same as Rock did. Him lightly swaying her judgment is a classic scene, but one that in a new context has a somewhat different meaning. I now think this wasn't so much a sway on her part, but more of a shift of duty. Admittedly, all the former Soviet wants is to dance in the pits of hell, mongering war for her own enjoyment. Life and death is just a game she can't get enough of. Rock didn't need to ask her to wipe out the Washimine clan to the last member, she would have done it anyway. She enjoys it and Yukio was already marked as we can see. The only thing that changes from this is who gets to cut off the head. That duty shifts to Rock and Revy, and the plan continues on the same. Only now, Balalaika has a new pawn to watch in this game, convincing Rock the blood of these deaths was on his hands. And it was, he did ask for them to happen. But it was like if someone offered you $20 to eat lunch. You'll take it, but that's not why you're eating. It was just an abuse of his want for change and to save others. This gets hammered home by the picture of Yukio she sends to cap off the season and the one he looks at to start Blood Trail. A message not of, you failed Rock, but one of, this was going to happen anyway. We had her marked from the start, Rock. This is likely one of the biggest factors of his depression here. His goodwill was used by those thriving in the darkness to cause more pain, more suffering, and he didn't even get any good out of it. This is the lesson from Japan. Unless you're at the top, a leader in this dark world, your efforts mean nothing. All you are is a tool for the stronger, darker people. So he stews in his hate, disgusted in the world around him and desperately wanting to tear it down, but with no faith he can change the situation. Only those at the top of the food chain can make that kind of change. And those people are given fully to the darkness. Then there's the meeting with Garcia, and look at his reactions to Chang and Revy. Chang jokes about Garcia's goals and Roberta, calling her the bloodhound of Florencia to his face, to the face of the person in the world who cares most about her. Chang only offers a meek apology. Then Revy, after Garcia begins to cry at the lack of compassion for his caretaker, chimes in with her so what attitude, saying, Cry me a damn river, no one gives a shit. Maybe a superhero will swoop down and come to the rescue. Something Rock visibly winces at and turns away from. His calling, the meaning he strives so hard for, is right there, asking anyone to reach out and take its hand to help someone who needs it, about to be lost to the city of the dead. And he does nothing. He reacts, wanting to, but he wouldn't offer up help after being played so well before. And he's not going to throw himself to the metaphorical hounds of Roanapur to be eaten alive, only to save one person. What's the point if the city consumes him? He would just become another Chang, saving one person but doing more harm than good overall. However, Garcia asks for Rock directly, and Chang breaks character, encouraging the Lovelace heir to not just let them handle this and help him, but specifically for Rock to do so. 
everyone reacts to this, seeing as it's an obvious ploy and Rock is no exception. This is something I didn't think about as much on my first pass, but this is just an open challenge. Chang 100% knows about the events of Japan. He and Balalaika are rivals, but info is essential and he's a man who could get it. He's openly attempting to use Rock's good faith to his advantage, and that's the most important part of this plan, this open challenge. This is probably the origin of Rock seeing Chang over Balalaika in the garage scene from Season 2. He's applying pressure to a potential pawn, challenging the man's views and saying, what are you going to do? This is just how he handles things, cleaner than his Soviet counterpart. Although Rock doesn't show it at first, he's justifiably angry when he's alone again. Hesitant to accept Garcia's offer in public, he throws himself at it full force, stabbing darts into his walls and covering every inch with mad scribbles. His ego was just stomped into the ground, and the rest of the Lagoon crew didn't help much if we're being honest. When he's not being used, he's being owned in a sense. Look at how they reference Rock in these early scenes. Dutch says, But we're not loaning Rock to you. Like he's a tool their neighbor wants to use. Sure, it's for his safety, but his safety as their object. They never ask if he actually wants to, they just tell him he won't be. Later, while they're setting up rules before he's even decided, he responds, Well, what do you know? Just another simple rule I have to follow. Showing his distaste for their ownership over him. This even relates back to the ass-kissing, in his words, and working for others he left behind for this life. The ugly idea of pointlessness rears its head in his life once more. He hasn't made a single meaningful change since he got here, and all he's doing is someone else's work once again. So I understand why he throws himself at this. This is a do or die moment where he defines his life as something meaningful or just another one of the living dead. And he comes up with a solution that lets him enter the darkness of Ranapur without having to stick around. A way he can be powerful enough to make his change, to save someone else, but not lose himself in the process. To not live long enough to see himself become the villain. The factors of this plan, the Triad, Hotel Moscow, the Colombian Cartel, FARC, the US, and the most scary of all, the one person army of Roberta. This is a powder keg waiting to burst and blow the whole city wide open. And the Triad, the major peacekeeper of Rowanapur, is having its critical drug trade threatened. If they lose that, the city is the next step for the US to handle. And a weakened Triad would fall against the world's military superpower, not to mention having much less of a reason to even hold the city. In this battle for the very foundation beneath their feet, Rock sees his opportunity to play mastermind and bring the game to an end. Allow the Americans to win, bring the attention of the world to Rowanapur, and destroy the darkness from within. He can drown in the cesspool if it's about to be drained anyway, and that gives him the power he needs to save people as well. Not only the ones right in front of him, but even others in the city. As he thought earlier, Every corner of this city is filled with people who struggle against overwhelming odds and fail, and are now just waiting to die. And anyone who might come to it later as well. This is the purpose he's been lacking in his old and new lives, the chance to free himself from every chain and damn the city that took so much. And understandably, he's more upbeat after this, oddly so, drawing surprise from the young pair. He's confident and joyous, a twist from how he ended in Japan. In fact, he gives one of his first smiles since the garage scene right here. Wait a second. The last time he smiled prior to this was then where he narrowly got away with his life, right as he was starting his hobby. This gives a lot of backing to Revy's concerns later that episode. She says, It's starting to get in your blood. You're starting to like the game. And she really couldn't be more right. Not just his attitude, but this smile, the way he talks in the scene. It's oddly Revy-like. He's likening his life to a bullet and a gun, a simplification similar to Revy's views on objects. Think about the war medal scene. He even uses guns, her favorite object, as the example. He remarks how he's just a bullet, his whole life he's been waiting for the powder to go off. But that's only if you view things traditionally. You could put a gun and a bullet together and never use them to kill. Load the gun but never fire it. These objects could even be broken down, changed and serve a new higher purpose. But he reduces things down to simple, violent objects and base actions. Load the gun, fire it, that's all. Revy, better than anyone else, 
understands what's going on in his mind right now. He's losing himself a little bit, apparent in his smiles that mirror hers. The smile she has will kill it. And you don't stay up all night, throw yourself at a problem and cover your walls in mad scribbles unless it's going to lead to something you enjoy. This is pleasure coming from Rock. And Revy, stuck in her own static mindset, recognizes this, but sees it as him simply being in over his head. But we covered this last video in Revy's Silver Bullet, so I'll put a card on screen now if you want more Revy. I think it's safe to say he does get too wrapped up in his plan though, and consequently the darkness as well. A lot of people will say his plan still saves Roberta, the Americans, and keeps Garcia alive as well, and that is true. But I think saving individuals fell to a lower status for him as time went on. Let's look at how he references them throughout his plan. He says about the American soldiers, If I want to help those men escape, I have to introduce another factor. We still have to get the Americans out of here. And these are his thoughts alone, where he could be free of the judgment others may have, seeing him as soft or stubborn, yet he's not referencing them as people to be saved, but pieces to be led. And really, his plan only saves a small amount of them. Roberta still paints that jungle red with US blood. This coldness on Rock's part goes even further, extending to Garcia. He thinks to himself, If Garcia can't get her to come back, I'll have to change his role in all this. Showing that this isn't a ploy to help Garcia full on. There's a role he's playing in Rock's game, and it'll change if needed for the final stage. It's about what use can be garnered from these people, even though there is some ideal of a savior left in him. And saving Roberta is down to simple logistics. The woman is a solo wrecking ball. They liken her to Arnold's most famous baddie for good reason. If she lives and doesn't cease her assault, every soldier there would have died, meaning the wider world could never wise up to Rowanapur, a crucial point of Rock's endgame. Again, he may have wanted to keep her alive for Garcia or her own sake, but it's undeniable he was using them as pawns in the same breath. All of this gives backing to how Chang reads Rock like a book. First, he angers Rock by claiming a maid and a child don't matter once war starts, hitting his pride there. But he only makes our protagonist have a full-on outburst after he mentions something else. Hypocrisy. The fact that he knows Rock has his own reasons for doing this, no matter how he presents it. And this garners one of the best responses in Black Lagoon. With all due respect, Mr. Chang, you are the goddamn piece of shit! Not to sound like a broken record, but this is also more of Rock acting like Revy. Bursting out when someone challenges their viewpoint, raging when the truth they don't want looks them in the eyes, denying that someone else may be similar enough to know. This isn't a coincidence. This is that fabled Rowan of her darkness creeping the way into the fiber of Rock's being. The inescapable pole he has resigned himself to but still hates in its entirety. And it's safe to say Chang was actually reading Rock here. Despite his help from higher powers and even ignoring his past, what's the outcome of all this? Exactly what Chang wants. Everything goes according to his plan in the end, which means Rock was fully and truly manipulated, as he did to others. And that means that Chang knew exactly what Rock was thinking. This pressure, the amped up hate for Chang, the city in its darkness, is one of the final pushes Rock needs to drop over the edge and start to drown. The dial is turned up to 11 as he starts to play even his closest friends. When he calls Dutch and Benny, giving them the job to transport the Americans, he pulls out a line in a look that probably threw many people off. When all this mayhem finally comes to an end, we can make a real killing here. It is shocking to see this change and I think that's the idea in Rock's head as well. He can't let them know what he's really after, the downfall of Rowanapur, so he has to 100% sell that he simply slipped off the deep end, striving for as much money as possible, no matter what the physical or mental cost. This is Rock playing his own part on the stage he references, gaming his allies into forwarding his manipulation. It's also perfectly capped off by his sheer lack of care for the money in the final scene, showing what his true intentions were here. He just lets it sit there until Dutch takes it. Money doesn't mean anything to him, going back to his very first scene of the OVA, saying, You should have let the street urchin keep the money. It's not like I have a lot left over for my paycheck. Right here, his interactions with Dutch and Benny, this is just a 100% well-played act. This lack of respect for his friends doesn't end there, though, showing up once again as he explains his plans to an injured and pissed-off Revy. 
Now seeing him for who he's really becoming, she storms topside to give him a piece of her mind to be met by a metaphorical brick wall. Rock responds, but hardly ever to her, instead talking at her. He somewhat admits his true goals to her in this way, as she asks, Is this your way of taking revenge on Rowanapur? And he simply keeps explaining himself. There's no denial, because there's nothing to deny. No acknowledgement, because he's so caught up in the game, and even admitting later, he accepted the darkness, saying, I wanted to win the game. This was the only way to finish it. But I'm fine with it. And the final straw for everyone's favorite gunslinger is when Rock says he must understand how Revy has felt all this time. This ignorance, believing it will all be okay, proclaiming he understands them, all while he used every possible friendly party around him, encapsulates him in that moment. A man caught up in his idea of change. Based on his experience and his ideas, trying to break down the world of others, using them to do so. Killing some to save others, but making sure it fits within his scheme. And failing to truly understand the person who needs him most. He's understanding what he wants to about Revy, not who she really is. So yeah, he should get kicked right here. And Fabiola gives us another perfect summary of what went down in the OVA, building on something Revy said earlier. In her bullet speech, she goes through a few different options for what type of bullet Rock would be, settling on a silver bullet. But like we said in the last video, that was just to her a skewed viewpoint of what she wanted. Rock isn't a silver bullet, he's a blank. The whole point was a front, a farce designed to make others see something different from what was really happening. In short, and using his own words, an act. People on stage performing. All a blank does is trick others for an act, as she puts it. Look, it's just a blank. Your magic trick was nothing but a handful of fake brass bullets. When shit hits the fan and the killing starts, a blank doesn't do you any good. Once the act is up, they're useless, more in the way than anything else. He took the shot, the one shot you get before they can see the lie, and he missed it. Now they all know that Rock is just a blank. And he sees this for himself at the end. Watching on, once again depressed as the world continues to turn, blind to the city of the dead before him. Chang, Balalaika, and Ada won, not him. He was just a blank in their plan, reassuring the interests of those who were always in power. Now he's more broken than before, seeing that even when he almost got consumed by the darkness, he still couldn't make much of a change. Sure, a few people lived, but does it really matter when his plan was just forced by someone else? He wanted to save them, but he didn't make it happen. They just let it happen. The meaning he was striving so desperately for, the change he worked so vigorously for, was all for naught. Feeling this weight, he can't even bring himself to take a fake shot at Rowanapur like Revy does. Because now he knows what he is to them. And he knows firing a blank won't do anything to this cursed city. And now for everyone's favorite Black Lagoon game show, Rock or Rock. Anyway, that'll wrap up my fourth Black Lagoon video here on the channel. It's been quite a wild ride with this anime, but I'm happy it happened because there's a lot to talk about here. If I hadn't gone on my anime list that one day and uh, picked a random series that looked kind of interesting to watch, we wouldn't be here. And I'm not talking about just the views or how these videos have exploded a bit, but I wouldn't be talking about this wonderful anime that so many of you love and I'm starting to love just as much. There's so much to unpack and every look has revealed a new layer of deep and complex and on the realistic characters for how zany the action can be and so many other great things like that. And that's why I have two videos on Rock and a video on Revy now with who knows maybe even more to come in the future. I even have a few ideas for some um, comedy based Black Lagoon videos that you might see in the future as well so keep an eye out for more. Anyway usual plugs at the end of the episode now. Link to my discord in the top of the description if you want to reach me directly, chat anime with some fans, or just talk about whatever is going on. It's a nice chill little hangout we have going on down there. Like the video if you did or even dislike if you didn't so I can check out that ratio and know what to uh, make for you all in the future because without you all watching and enjoying I'm just an insane man yelling at a wall and 
That may be slightly true, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, also, leave me a comment letting me know if you liked the video, uh, if there was a part you enjoyed most, if there's something I missed, or anything you want to add, because that's one of my favorite parts of doing this, is getting to see what you all have to add to this as well, and uh, make it a more full experience. Also, if you want more videos like the ones on screen now, consider subscribing if you're not already to see more videos like those. I'm starting to repeat myself and make this outro terrible, so I'll stop rambling, let you get back on with your day, and just say thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you again soon, despite my terrible outro.